So, uh, welcome, Tom. Uh, so, Tom Clays is uh, here with us from uh, uh, from overseas. So, he's from you see uh, Louvain, and uh, he's going to talk about the uh, well. You can see the title: Air Kernel Determinants, Decay, Leave Equation, and Conditional Point Processes. So, uh, please, I'll give you the floor and. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Ferenc, for the invitation to, to speak. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's online, but okay. on the other hand, uh, it makes it also easy to, to talk it's at over, overseas uh, seminars without uh, the need to travel. So that's also an advantage. So um, I, I, I assume that there, I know that there are some experts in the audience on the, the topics that I will talk about. Probably there are also some people that are less familiar with the things I, I will talk about. So I will try to have something for, for everyone. The beginning will probably be less interesting for those who, who know these things. And, and then at the end, I, I hope to have something interesting also for the, the experts uh, on the topic. So um, yeah, so I will talk about several things and I will try to make it into a coherent story where I will connect uh, airy kernel fretholm determinants, the, the Korteweg de Vries equation, and some conditional uh, point processes. And so most of the things that I will talk about are um, based on joint works. Some of them are still in progress with several people, uh, Mattia Cafasso, Giulio Huzza, Gabriel Glessner, and uh, Christophe Chardier. So um, good. So please don't hesitate to ask questions already during the talk. If you have any questions, it's I always feel more comfortable uh, if I get some uh, questions and responds. It gives less of the feeling to be talking to a, to a computer screen. Um, so let's start from the beginning. So. I will talk about uh, determinantal point processes. And there's not so much you need to know about the deter determinantal point process if you're not familiar with probability theory. There are two things that you should remember for the rest of this talk. That is that in a determinantal point process, we have uh, correlation functions of any order. And these correlation functions, they can be written as a determinant of a kernel. This is called the correlation kernel. And this is the most important object, analytically speaking, in a determinantal point process. In principle, this is, this is a point process that you can study just by analyzing a function depending on two uh, variables. So for us, I will talk about point processes on the real line. So all these variables, xj, they are real variables here. Um, and then there is also, so this um, characterizes the, the point process, the determinantal point process. There's also an alternative characterization, which is for some purposes uh, more convenient. That is via the, the Laplace functional. So the Laplace functional of a point process is the, is the average of the product over all the points in the point process with respect to a certain test function uh, phi or one minus phi here. This can be any measurable, reasonable function uh, on, on the real line, defined on the real line. And so for a determinantal point process, this Laplace functional, it's equal to a Fretholm determinant. And this Fretholm determinant, so it's the Fretholm determinant of an operator and this operator is the identity operator minus this phi. I understand it as the multiplication operator with the function phi. And k is the integral operator with kernel, the correlation kernel k. So you can also, in terms of kernel, you can also uh, define this Fretholm determinant just directly by the, the Fretholm series, which is written here. So it's an infinite sum of uh, integrals, and these integrals they involve determinants of the of the kernel. So these Fretholm determinants, these will be 
important in, in what I will, uh, will talk about. And in fact, the, the, the first part of my talk will be mostly about the spread home determinants. And it's only towards the end that really the interpretation in terms of a point process will become important. So uh, the, oops, there's a, um, The, the one of the most uh, well-known examples of a, of a determinantal point process on the real line, it's, uh, it's the eigenvalue distribution of, of many random matrix ensembles. I will consider here the Gaussian unitary ensemble. So it's a square n by n Hermitian matrix with entries who are up to the Hermitian symmetry independent uh, Gaussian uh, random variables. And then the eigenvalue distribution in this ensemble is given by this uh, formula. So you have this van der Monde determinant squared, and you have the product of the Gaussian uh, weight function. I normalized it here in a certain way, but uh, that's not, not so important. And so for this, um, for this distribution, it's well known that the correlation kernel it's actually the Christoffel Darboux kernel uh, for the Hermit polynomials, normalized Hermit polynomials. So these PJs here, they are the normalized Hermit polynomials. You can also, if you prefer, write this uh, by using the, the Christoffel Darboux identity in terms of the polynomials Pn and Pn minus one only. Um, so now, um, in this um, in this GUE uh, ensemble, you can take certain scaling limits, a bulk scaling limit and edge scaling limit. I will not go into many details here, but the, the, the essence is that the eigenvalues in the GUE, they typically um, follow a semicircle uh, law. And so if you rescale the eigenvalues near a point in the somewhere in the middle of this semicircle, then you um, by taking a suitable scaling limit, you find another determinantal point process, which is the one defined by the correlation kernel, which is the sine kernel. So that's a, a point process of a somewhat different nature because here, so in the GUE, you have n uh, particles. So the, the number of particles is, is finite. Here in the sign process, sign point process, the number of uh, points is almost surely uh, infinite. Okay. And then there's another uh, scaling limit which uh, arises near the edge of the, the semicircle law. And if you scale in a suitable way the eigenvalues there, then you uh, find the, the airy kernel. So this is the, the, the airy kernel is, is this kernel. You can write it in two different ways. Both will, this is probably the most standard form of the airy kernel, but this is also a form which will be convenient for us uh, later on. And so this airy point process, it's a well-known uh, and, and, and much uh, studied uh, point process. So it has the property that there is almost surely uh, a largest point, and it has all, also uh, almost surely an infinite number of uh, particles. So these are uh, the two uh, properties one, one, one can think of. And so it's points on the real line. So you have a largest particle, and then there are some particles to the left, which will uh, repel each other in some way. And um, yes, there are somewhat more particles towards minus infinity than there are uh, at finite uh, values. So this, uh, you can think of, of something like this as a typical configuration in this uh, airy point process. So one of the things that is very well uh, known about the, the airy point process is the, 
distribution of the largest points in this uh, in this process. And so this um, this is actually a, a special case of the Laplace functional that I talked to you about. So if we take the function phi that I showed you on the previous slide, if we take that to be the indicator function of uh, a semi-infinite uh, interval, then this is the, the probability distribution, the, the probability that the largest points in this point process is smaller than S. So this is this largest particle distribution, and this is nothing else than the Tracy Bidom uh, distribution, or one of the Tracy Bidom distribution. There are several of them, but this is probably the, the, the best uh, known. And um, so this describes the um, distribution of the of the largest eigenvalue in, in the GUE, for example, also in, in many other random matrix ensembles. And there are, there are also other uh, famous occurrences of this Tracy Bidom distribution, for instance, related to the length of the longest increasing subsequence of a, of a random permutation and also in tiling models for instance this uh, disappears there are quite some other models uh, as well okay so um yes let me say a couple of more things about this tracy rhythm distribution which are um very well known but um well, we, we, we need these, these properties later on because we want to, to generalize them uh, later on. So one uh, thing is the, the, the Panavet 2 representation of the Tracy Bidom distribution. So we can express it as a, an exponential involving then an integral of a certain function uh, y. And this function y, it's, the, it's a solution to the Panavet 2 equation, which is this second order ODE. And it's, uh, it's the hastings McLeod solution. This means that it's the unique solution characterized by this uh, behavior at uh, plus infinity. So in fact, only this condition at plus infinity already uniquely characterizes the solution. Um, and we also have this behavior at infinity, but in fact, we, we don't need it even to, to characterize the, the solution. So then um, this may seem a bit artificial, but um, there's a, a well-known relation between the, the Panavet 2 equation and the Korteweg de Vries equation. And that is the following. It's an easy exercise to, to verify this. But if we, so Y is a solution to the Panavet 2 equation. If we then take this combination here, um, and we call this function u of xt, then this function u uh, solves the Korteweg de Vries equation in this form. It's just uh, a matter of checking, and it's true for any uh, solution to the Panavet 2 equation, not only for the Hastings McLeod solution. Uh, however, for the special case of the Hastings McLeod solution, we also have this right hand side that thanks to this um, Panavet 2 representation that I showed you, we can also write this function u in terms of a second logarithmic derivative of the, of the distribution. Um, so one more thing about this that I, I should uh, mention, that is that the, the initial data of this solution so t going to zero asymptotics, they are not uh, well posed, uh, namely, and, and this you can also check it by hand by substituting here uh, the asymptotics for the hastings mcleod solution at plus and minus infinity. And if you do that, you see that the leading order for negative values of s when t goes to zero is uh, x over 2t. So this blows up when t goes to zero. Um, but for positive x, there the initial data are well defined, and there you find 1 over 8 times x squared as the leading order. And so the transition between those two types of behavior takes place on a scale 
where x is of the order uh, t one third. And so there this transition takes place be between this uh, singular behavior that we have for negative values and well, let, let's call it regular initial data that we have for positive values of, of x. Okay, so now let's go one step um, further. If we, so the, the Gaussian unitary ensemble, it's um, can be seen as a model for uh, zero temperature free fermions. Now there's also a finite temperature analog for that. And in that um, model, you, you also get to an analog of the Tracy Widom distribution, but then this Tracy Widom distribution is, is, the, uh, is uh, replaced by um, a, a deformed version, deformed version in the sense that the kernel is no longer the, the airy kernel, but it's a deformation of, of it. So recall that um, if we replace here this function sigma by the indicator function of zero infinity, then we recover the airy kernel. But now the relevant function here is this um, logistic function, one over one plus exponential of minus uh, r. So here you see a picture of this function. It's a function that decays exponentially fast to zero at minus infinity. It converges exponentially fast to one at plus infinity. Um, yes, well, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's it. So this model has been studied by many people in, in physics literature, also in mathematics literature. <clears throat> the, the list I give here is, is, uh, is not very complete. Um, so that is presumably not an integrable kernel. Um, yeah, good question. So it depends what you understand by an integrable uh, kernel. So, um, it, um, yes, in, in the classical sense of its Isergin, uh, Korobin, and Slavnov, this is not an integrable kernel because you cannot write it as a with a finite number of terms, but you can write it with an inter, uh, infinite number of uh, of terms as an integral integrable uh, kernel, and so. Um, you, you could see it as a natural generalization of an integrable kernel, but I will come back to this, but it's a very good um, observation. This will indeed be one of the questions that uh, that, that will, will be interested in uh, later on. But is it the case that to compute its resolvent, it's equivalent to a riemann hiller problem? Uh, yes, but uh, yes. Yeah, I will come back to it, but it's a, the answer is yes, but an operator valued Riemann-Hilbert problem. Whereas for the, say, the classical theory of its Isergin, Korobin, and Slavnov, you would have a finite matrix valued Riemann-Hilbert problem. Here it would be an operator valued Riemann-Hilbert so, problem. So like an infinite dimensional Riemann-Hilbert problem. Exactly, yes, but I will come back to it, it, it uh, later. Yeah. Okay, so now there's an, another context where this finite temperature uh, Tracy Widom distribution uh, appears, namely in the context of the, the KPZ equation. KPZ stands for Kardar Parisi Zang. And it's a, it's a stochastic PDE, which you see here. Uh, it's not so important to understand exactly what it means because it's, it's a stochastic PDE, this psi. Here it's a random uh, term, it's called space-time white noise, and so it's not obvious at all what it means to be a solution to this uh, equation. There's a whole theory behind this. Uh, I will not really talk about it. Um, what is important for us is that, well, it, it's an interesting equation because there, is a, there are a lot of applications of, of them because it's, a, it's sort of a uh, universal model for um, random growth phenomena, random interface growth. And so it models uh, quite some uh, real life phenomena like uh, bacterial growth, also well, 
coffee stains, it's maybe a, a bit less scientifically interesting, but possibly also forest fires, uh, the burning of, of, of papers, um, possibly even tumor growth in some, in some cases. So there's really a whole um, variety of, of applications to this KPZ equation. Um, so now what's the connection between the finite temperature Tracy Widom distribution and this KPZ equation? Well, it's, there's one, there are a number of physically relevant solutions to KPZ. And one of them is what is called the narrow wedge uh, solution. And this means formally, and again, I, I will not define rigorously what this means, but it means that the initial data can be written as the logarithm of a delta function. Okay, this is quite abstract. There's a, uh, there's a way to give, give a mathematical meaning to this. Um, it, the, 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 this mathematical meaning goes actually via the, the Kohl-Hopf transformation and then you map the KPZ equation to the uh, stochastic heat equation. Um, so this solution is something that uh, typically behaves like a parabola this minus x squared over 2t, which becomes more and more narrow when t goes to, uh, to zero. And um, what is important for us is that this solution is uh, characterized uh, by the uh, finite temperature Tracy Widom distribution. In fact, the finite temperature Tracy Widom distribution is a Laplace transform of the solution to the stochastic heat equation. So it's a not very direct connection, but it's a characterization. It's an identical, it's an identity. And uh, the, the finite temperature Tracy Widom, Widom distribution uh, contains all the information about the distribution of this, uh, this solution to the, to, to the KPZ equation. So this is uh, one example of a, uh, a result, it's a, it's a result that was um, obtained by Amir Corwin and Quastel in, in around 2010, and also independently by um, some other groups um, with varying uh, levels of rigor, I would say. So Amir Corwin Quastel had a complete rigorous proof, then Sazamoto and Spohn also had an almost uh, complete proof, but there was some step that they couldn't pre prove, um, prove rigorously. And then there were also some, some works more in the, in the physics uh, literature. And then these results were later uh, reformulated by Borodin and uh, Gorin. Not Gorin. Um, nowadays, there are much more general results, um, not only for the KPZ equation, but also for the, what is called the KPZ fixed point, which is a much more general uh, thing. There are um, Fretholm determinant uh, expressions for, uh, for solutions. So this, this was now uh, proved a couple of years ago by uh, Matetsky, uh, Quastel and, and Remenik. And th there's a, uh, a lot of activity in this, uh, in this field. Um, okay, so the, the main message for us to, to take from this KPZ business is that um, if we're interested in understanding this KPZ solution with narrow wedge initial data, then all we need to do is to understand this um, finite temperature Tracy Widom distribution, that's this Fretholm determinant, or another one, because you can prove using some algebraic manipulations of the of the operators, you can prove that this uh, these two determinants are actually equal. And um, that brings us back to to John's question, because as I said, this finite temperature uh, Tracy Widom uh, distribution, the, the this kernel, this deformation of the airy kernel this uh, cannot directly be written in this form. So this is what is called the, it's Isergin Korapin Slavnov integrable form of the, of, of a kernel. 
And if you have such a form, then you can characterize, as John already said, then you can characterize the, the determinant or logarithmic derivatives of the determinant by, um, uh, in terms of a Riemann Hilbert problem. Now, um, if, if you look at uh, this determinant, and if you look at this uh, operator or kernel of an operator, this one is of integrable form with uh, the value of k equal to 2. And so, um, although these, these two determinants are um, identical, there's a whole, it's a, it's a different approach if you, um, so, so in a way, this is, the, is the, the, the best one for us to analyze because then we, 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 we can characterize things in terms of a two by two Riemann Hilbert problem. But also, there are also interesting things to say about uh, this one, um, because, yeah, as I said, it leads you to an operator valued Riemann Hilbert problem. And um, so, in fact, uh, Thomas Botner uh, studied this representation of the Fretholm determinant and managed to uh, to prove certain results about uh, uh, about it by using this operator value to Riemann Hilbert approach. So the so both approaches are, are uh, have something interesting in them. So for us, we will uh, focus on this uh, two by two Riemann Hilbert representation, and this is what we use to to produce our uh, results. So yes, so in in a way, um, one of the things that we are interested in is the asymptotic behavior of these Fretholm determinants. For instance, when S goes to infinity or capital T goes to zero or to infinity, there are various uh, asymptotic regimes which are interesting. And so in general, one can say that asymptotic analysis of a Fretholm determinant, it's, uh, it's easy if the norm of the operator K is small, because then this Fretholm series expansion that I showed you, it's just an asymptotic series. And you can just read off the different terms and they, they provide you immediately with an asymptotic series. But if the kernel K is not of small norm, then it's, a, it's in general very hard to obtain asymptotics. And then we need to rely on this uh, riemann hilbert methods of uh, its either again, uh, Korapin and, uh, and Slavnov. Also, uh, um, Marco Bertola and Mattia Quafasso made, made some uh, um, further developed this uh, this Riemann Hilbert method in the in the past uh, ten years probably. All right, so let me now um, start to state some of the results that we can prove um, based on this two by two Riemann Hilbert uh, representation. And to do that, we need to make a change of variables. So recall that in the um, um, in this uh, Fretholm determinant, we had two uh, parameters, S and T. We'll make a change of variables just because it will be convenient afterwards, essentially because it, it will allow us to derive the KDV equation. Um, and so we define new variables x and little t. So these are the, the two new variables. And now in terms of these variables, our function sigma is now evaluated at this argument. And so you can you should think of it in the following way. So the function sigma, it's a function like this roughly. It's a probability distribution. Um, and now we evaluate it at, at this argument. So it means that um, the smaller t, the, the sharper the, 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 this, this graph will become. So then it will become steeper. So for smaller value of t, you will rather have something like this. And then there's also this, the role of x and, and x over t. Um, and that is a shift. 
So the, the value of x shifts the, the function to the right or to the left. So these are qualitatively, this is what, what happens. The, the t measures the steepness of the function and x uh, determines where the, the function is centered. That's more or less how you should think of it. Um, yes, yeah, so as I already told you, but uh, okay, I didn't write it in this form, but we can write this operator in integrable form, for instance, in this way. There are also many other ways to write it in, in integrable forms. It doesn't really matter too much. There's some freedom in, in how to take these, uh, these vectors, f and, and h. Um, but so then, so the, the well, the, in, in fact, this is the starting point, one could say, of the approach of, of uh, it's Izergin, Korobin, Slavnov. That is that if you take a logarithmic derivative of a, of a Fredholm determinant, so the, that is equal to the, so by the Jacobi identity, this can be written as the trace of an operator. So you have, uh, formally speaking, we have the log determinant, which is the trace of the log. And so by applying this uh, Jacobi identity um, to, the, to the X logarithmic derivative, we obtain that this logarithmic derivative is equal to this. And so here, this is a, you should interpret this not as a kernel now, but really as an operator, because you have here the inverse of an, of an operator. Um, one can show that this operator is indeed invertible. And then here you have a multiplication operator with the derivative of sigma uh, multiplied with the, the airy kernel operator. And well, you can rewrite this. Uh, it may seem artificial to do this, but you can rewrite this as the trace of a certain function. So the derivative of sigma divided by one minus sigma times this operator k tilde. And this operator k tilde, it's uh, this operator. So it's one minus uh, sigma times the airy kernel operator times the inverse of this, uh, this operator. So this looks like a resolvent. It's not exactly a resolvent because I multiplied here with one, one minus sigma. Uh, it may seem artificial because I multiply here with one minus sigma and here I divide by one minus sigma. So this seems a bit, a bit silly to do, but in fact, there is a good reason for it. That is that uh, as I will uh, show you later on this k tilde it is the kernel uh, it is well the kernel of this operator defines a determinantal point process which is a very natural determinantal point process and that's the reason why i write it in in this way um yes by the way so there there are different ways to write this kernel because um the airy kernel operator, it's a projection operator, it's a Hermitian projection operator. So in fact, we could also write this as one minus sigma uh, times the airy operator, times the airy operator times the inverse. So you can write this as a conjugation of the of the airy kernel operator. This would not be true for for any kernel but for an, a projection operator this is uh, this is the same all right so yes so this this new kernel that we have k tilde we can express this in terms of a of a 2 by 2 riemann hubert problem I, I will not bother you with the details of this riemann hubert problem but um i will just um state some of the results that we can derive using this uh, riemann hubert representation and so the first um, results gives some uh, differential equations and so one is the is a connection with the kdv equation so here um 
recall that we for q equal to the um, tracy widom distribution um we, we I, I already explained you that this function u is a solution to the kdv equation now this is also true for this sigma um of r that we considered which was 1 over 1 plus e to the minus r and it's 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 also true for a quite large class of function sigma so um i just write here for a large class of function sigma essentially what you need is you need a function that goes to zero at minus infinity that goes to one at plus infinity uh, that is increasing although that is probably not even really uh, necessary uh, you need it to be smooth enough. Also, that is not really necessary. You could have a finite number of discontinuities. Um, and then there are some technical regularity assumptions we need on sigma, but um, it, it holds for quite a general family of uh, functions sigma. And so this, um, yeah, so this function u solves the KDV equation here and we can also write it in a in an integral form where the the integrand here is a solution to the schrodinger equation with uh, with this potential u and okay with with a certain type of of asymptotic behavior um now what is um, what is interesting about this is that if we uh, substitute this um, identity, if we substitute that into this Schrodinger equation, then we arrive to um, this equation, which is an integral differential version of the Panevé 2 equation. Because if you, so this is a non local term in the differential equation. So if here you would just have um, a Dirac measure instead of this d sigma, um, then this would be the Panevé 2 equation. But now it's an integral differential, a non local version of Panevé 2, which was in fact also found by Amir Corwin and uh, Quastel using different uh, methods. And um, Yes, so this, this allows us to, this is in a way the analog of the Tracy Widom formula for these deformations of the of the, the finite temperature version of the of Tracy Widom. So this this is what we can deduce from the two by two Riemann Hubert problem. In a way, this is not very um, surprising. And for instance, the the fact that these solutions are, uh, or, or that these determinants are related to the KDV equation was essentially known, um, somewhat forgotten in the literature, but there are um, results by Popper and Sattinger already from the 80s that related Fretholm determinants with KDV. And so essentially, not precisely in this form and also using very different methods, but the fact that these determinants are related to KDV is definitely not um, not our uh, uh, result. We just derive it in, in another way and, and, and we, we recover this, but it's definitely not our thing. There are also more recently um, results of a similar um, flavor where Fretholm um, determinants are connected to other types of, uh, of equations, uh, some to KDV, also the KP equation. Um, I forgot to mention here. Uh, yes, I think I mentioned them some, somewhere later, but there are also results by Quastel and uh, Remenik that uh, relate um, Fretholm determinants to, to the KP equation in their case. So what is, uh, what is really something that we can do thanks to this two by two Riemann Hubert representation, it is uh, studying the initial data of these KDV solutions. So that is really something, something less uh, obvious. 
And so this is the, the result we, we obtain. And that is also the reason why I showed you in the case of, uh, of, of the classical Tracy rhythm distribution, the self-similar uh, KDV solution, uh, what the, the asymptotic behavior of it is. So you re recall maybe that we had singular behavior for negative values of X and uh, regular behavior at, uh, for positive values of X. And this is the same here. So we have the same type of singular behavior. We have a different type of regular behavior in the sense that this function that we have here, it's a function independent of T, but it depends on the function sigma. We have some further properties of it. It's in fact, um, it's a solution to an integral differential version of the Penevay five equation. And we have some asymptotics for this function V sigma as well. But um, yes, the, the most important here is that it's it's independent of T. And, uh, and then the, the transition between these two types of behavior takes place again on, on scales uh, where X is of the order T to the one third. And then the leading order orders of the asymptotics or expressed in terms of the hastings mccloud solution to, to Panavé 2, the classical Panavé 2. And so this, in fact, it's the, this is exactly the self-similar KDV solution that I showed you at the beginning. So um, yes, yeah, so summarizing in a in a phase diagram, um, well, so we have t on the vertical axis. I, I'm not sure if it's really well readable, and we have x on the horizontal axis. And so we have um, when t goes to zero, we have at the left we have this singular behavior. Okay, it's like x over two t. At the right we have regular behavior, and then transition in the middle is that there is a Panavé 2 uh, behavior. And um, so in a way we can see this as a as an um, inverse scattering problem for a family of KDV solutions, of unbounded KDV solutions with ill post initial data. But in a way this is this is scattering theory for KDV. And so the classical um, Scattering theory for KDV holds for uh, bounded solutions, in particular for solutions that decay sufficiently fast at plus and minus infinity. But there, also, there is also scattering theory more recently uh, that, that was uh, established for certain families of unbounded solution, in particular Itz and Sukhanov had some um, uh, unbounded solution, also uh, Boris Dubrovin and, and uh, Alexander Minakov had a different class of unbounded solution for, for which, which they developed uh, direct and inverse uh, scattering theory. But the solutions that we um, recover here are not in these classes. So as far as we know, there's no scattering theory known for these solutions. In a way, what we do here is inverse scattering theory but we don't have direct scattering theory. So we would like to know that if, if we have a, um, uh, if we have a initial data for KDV, ill posed, but let's say that it behaves like X over two T at the left in some way. And, and, and so we have this type of initial behavior. Then first of all is, is the KDV equation well posed for this type of initial data that's already not, not known as far as we know. And also, um, uh, if that is the case, can we, um, can we characterize this solution in terms of a Riemann Hilbert problem? Because for us, it's the other way around. We start from scattering data. In a way, this function sigma, you can think of it as scattering data. And then we recover initial data. So that's inverse scattering. We would like in a way also to, to be able to do direct scattering, sc start, starting from initial behavior. Can we recover uh, some kind of scattering data? Like something 
that generalizes the reflection coefficient. This is something we have no idea how to um, how to approach this. It, it seems technically also quite quite hard. So at the moment we're we're happy to to understand how the inverse scattering works, but the direct scattering we don't really have a have a good idea. Um, so these initial data are interesting not only because okay, it's it's. Uh, KDV equation is a, is a well-known equation and an equation that people study, but it's also uh, in view of this KPZ um, equation, it's also important because the initial data for the KDV solution, in fact, they imply lower tail estimates for the distribution of the KPZ equation. And in fact, these initial data, you have to do some work, it's not a direct consequence, but because of these initial data, we were able to uh, refine the lower tail estimates uh, for KPZ that had been obtained uh, earlier. So this is uh, also worth mentioning. <clears throat> so now, okay. So as promised, I will now tell you something more about um, these uh, these kernel skate tilde or, or these operator skate tilde so recall that this was the way to define this operator k tilde and the kernel of this operator um, is a uh, is the kernel defining a, a determinantal point process namely a conditional uh, airy point process which you can construct as follows um, okay, so we, we consider a configuration in the airy point process. So recall we have almost surely a largest particle, and then we have an infinite number of particles to the left of it, like this. Now I will plot the graph of this function uh, sigma. as a fun function of u. So this will be, depending on the value of x and t, this will be um, a, a more rapidly or slower varying function. And there will be a shift to the right or to the left. But So you can think roughly as this, as the, uh, to this, uh, as this picture as the, the shape of the graph of sigma. And so now we're going to define a, a marking of the airy point process and this means that so we'll we'll give every particle in this in the in the configuration we will give it a mark and the mark can be either zero or one and we do this uh, independently for each particle um, so for each particle we will um, give the particle mark one with probability sigma of u and mark zero with probability one minus sigma. So that means that uh, the particles far to the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the left, they are likely to have mark zero. So let's assume that this one has mark zero. Okay, and then maybe here, or well, here the sigma is still very low, so let's assume all these get mark zero, and then maybe this one is the first that gets mark one. Here maybe another one with mark zero, and let's say this is mark one again. But it's a random marking, so you give independently to each particle you give a mark. Okay, and this mark is, even though it's independent, but the mark is position dependent, uh, depending on the value of the particle, you're more likely to receive mark one or mark zero. Okay, so this is the marked uh, marked airy point process. Now, um, what we're going to do is we're going to condition this process on a certain uh, event. And the event that we will con condition on is the event that there are no points with mark one. So that's a very serious conditioning. It's, it's very 
one would say it's unlikely there there's an infinite number of particles and none of them can have mark uh, mark one but um, but nevertheless this probability is non-zero for every x and t and so you it's a classical type of conditioning you can just condition on this uh, on this event and if you condition on this event you get a new point process i call this the conditional airy point process and this conditional airy point process this is precisely the determinantal point process with kernel k tilde and so this gives in fact for this for these kernels this gives a nice interpretation of the jacobi identity because the jacobi identity expresses the log derivative of a, a multiplicative functional in the in the airy point process expresses it is expresses it as a as a trace which is a additive functional in a new point process which is this conditional point process and this um, in fact we didn't realize this um, when we started studying studying it's, it, it's more recently that we we understood this um, but um, yes and this is in fact true uh, for not only for the airy kernel this is a very general thing if you if you have a any type of kernel you multiply with it with some uh, multiplication operator if you apply the jacobi identity to this type of operator well you will always get to this kernel k tilde uh, of such a conditional uh, point process and um, this is it's not just well it's it's nice as an as a probabilistic interpretation of of the jacobi identity but it's not only that because um the it is also important in the riemann hubert analysis if you want to derive asymptotics from the riemann hubert problem people who are familiar with this they know that you you typically need to con construct a certain g function some equilibrium measure and in fact this g function or equilibrium measure in this case this will be the limiting density of particles in this conditional area point process and initially in fact when we did this asymptotic analysis we didn't realize this and we had to do this by hand and we managed to construct this equilibrium measure but we did it well just by brute force we tried and at some point we found it but we didn't really understand what we were doing and now we understood that in fact if we would have known at that point that there is this this point process interpretation we would have would have known much better um, what type of equilibrium measure that we had to construct and in fact now there's i didn't really uh, emphasize this but there's one remaining region where we don't understand the 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 behavior the, the initial data yet that is for when x goes also to, to to plus infinity and now we're working on this and we believe that we can we can handle this also and in part, this is thanks to this uh, interpretation at, in, in terms of a point process. So may I ask, so with this G function that you find the equilibrium measure is, uh, is it um, how explicit it is? Uh, yeah, it's, it's very explicit. The, um, I mean, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, yeah, okay. I cannot just uh, right introduce it here, but you can just write it down. It's a very explicit function. Uh, the only thing is that there's an end point as usual, there's an end point involved. And there is an equation for this endpoint, mm -hmm. but it's a polynomial equation, so it's fairly. So it's a it's a, um, um, but it's one gap, one one yes. cut, one gap, and it's actually so it's um, th there's more to say about it because um, so remember this um, this this conditioning, so if we assume that um, that x is um, large and positive, then this function sigma will shift to the right. And then that means that uh, most particles will get mark zero. Mm -hmm. And then this conditioning that we do, it's a very like it's very likely that the event on which we condition will happen. 
and then you don't really change the airy point process. So for x large, the picture is that the this equilibrium measure will be the density of the airy point process itself, which is asymptotically as a square root law, like this. So here, if you're uh, far to the to the right, this is the the picture. On the other hand, if you're far to the left, if I return to the to the marked uh, process here, so far to the left, that means that the marking function sigma will shift to the left. That means that many points will typically receive mark one. And it's very unlikely if you have a typical airy point process configuration, it's very unlikely that all of them will receive uh, will receive mark zero. So then it's a, it's a conditioning on an, on an event that is extremely unlikely, but still with non-zero probability, but very unlikely. And uh, so then this conditioning really changes the, the nature of the airy point process. Because then all the typical configurations, which have this um, square root law, uh, they will be conditioned out. And what remains is configurations, which typically look like uh, something like this, which look like a, a hard edge density, something like that. And then in between here, you have something that interpolates between. Uh, you, you would have something like like this, and then you would have a peak, but then it would turn into a soft edge again, something like that. So that's more or less the behavior. And this is, so you get, you go from the density of the unconditioned airy point process. And then if X becomes smaller, this conditioning starts to have an effect and it sort of pushes the eigenvalues uh, yeah, I mean, the position of my zero here is not very accurate, but you can think of it as it, it pushes the eigenvalues or the particles to the left. And then when x goes to minus infinity, um, it pushes the eigenvalues even more to the left. But the difference between the, the, the very left picture and the middle picture is that, um, so it, it, the left picture there, the conditioning in fact means that the configurations that you keep, they're simply configurations for which there are no large points. In the middle picture, there's a balance between um, which configurations you keep. Because the configurations you keep, they can be either configurations for which have no large points, but it could also be that they are typical configurations, but with an untypical marking. And so for the middle picture, you have a balance between those two. So this is the, 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 this is a rather subtle um, transition when, when X decreases. But I think it's, it's, uh, it's quite interesting to see how this conditional point process actually determines the, the behavior of the, the Fretton determinants. And as I said, this is not only the case for the, of course, these pictures are, are uh, for the airy point process. But it's this interpretation in terms of this conditional uh, point process, this holds for any, um, any determinant of point process. So um, yes, with this, I, I would like to conclude. So thanks a lot for, uh, for your attention. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. So we already had one question. And yeah, let's, uh, let's see if there are others. Um, uh, but uh, if I can ask them, so mm -hmm. these, uh, uh, this Riemann-Hilbert problem two by two, right? Is it associated with some kind of Penleve equation that? Uh... Um, no, so the thing is, uh, I can go back to, in some special cases it is, but uh, in general not. So because, um, this is the integrable form of the mm -hmm. of the of the operators, and you have this function sigma. So if your function sigma would just be an, a constant function or piecewise constant uh, or indicator function of a, of an interval, let's say, then it would be um, Panavé or maybe some Panavé hierarchy or or coupled Panavé system. 
but for a general function sigma, which is not piecewise constant, the best one can say is that, well, it's integral differential penalty. So it's a non-local penalty. But for the specific sigma that you have, the logistic is not, uh, you cannot reduce it to some ODE. Um, it's not, uh, Mm, yeah, well, that's it's not impossible. So for for general sigma, I would say there's no hope. For this specific sigma, it's not impossible, and maybe then this operator value three maneuvered approach is more uh, suitable. Okay. I don't know. In fact, for us in this two by two three maneuvered approach, this uh, logistic function it just doesn't really simplify many things. Uh, well, there are some convenient things like this um, This sigma prime over one minus sigma, it takes a simple form. But apart from that, uh, the, this logistic function um, doesn't really simplify things much with respect to other uh, smooth function sigma. So could I just ask you, you had this sort of uh a phase diagram with three different critical regions. Yes. Uh, the middle, if I remember the middle region was just a perturbation of ordinary Hastings McLeod or something like that. The, the, the uh, uh, whereas the, the left-hand side, there was an, in, uh, I guess an integral, I'm not sure what it, what it characterized the kernel. There was, a, there was a, a modified kernel, which was, that was the one with the operator Riemann Hilbert problem. Uh, wait, so it's not this picture that you're referring to. It is this picture, yes, this picture. Ah, and so we have the middle region inside that parabolic there. It looks just like ordinary tan of A2, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there and on the left, there's it's there's some singular region there. Where yeah, but that in fact is also just like pan of A2, it's like the asymptotics of pan of A2, one could say. Okay, but then so, you say on the right, yeah that it's like pan of a5. So you didn't explain why pan of a5 comes in, but pan of a5 is, I don't know if it's a coincidence, but pan of a5 is what characterizes the bulk region. Is that a coincidence? No, it's not a coincidence. No, it's, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a good observation. So indeed, so I also didn't say that this left region is, is actually the easy region. That's the region where the norm of the operator is small. And so there you get the results almost for free. Uh, the right region you is- You don't the, need Riemann-Hilbert problem there. It's just, it's just the asymptotic uh, series. Yeah, but um, yes, it's definitely, so if you would uh, take our results for, uh, for sigma, an indicator function of a semi-infinite interval, then um, this is indeed the region where instead of the airy kernel determinant, you would have the sine kernel determinant. Ah. And so indeed, there you get exactly pan of A5. But it's still, so this is still the, edge region. It's the edge, but you scale into the bulk in a way. Ah. So it's the, it's like the, if you take the airy function for large arguments, you get to, to oscillations, you get to sine oscillations, and so you can see the sine kernel as a limit of the airy kernel. So in terms of eigenvalues, you can think that you're at the edge, but you scale yourself just slightly out of the edge towards the bulk. And that's why it becomes pan of A5. And that's why you get pan of A5, but here we don't get just pan of A5, but we get an integral differential um, generalization of it. But indeed, that uh, sort of uh, explains why we get pan of A5 or, or a generalization of it. Yes, that's, uh, that's yes. true. So it's just sort of uh, not quite at the edge or somewhere between some hybrid between edge and bulk. Yeah, you could you could think of it some intermediate, some maybe mesoscopic scale away from the edge, uh, something like that, yeah. Okay, so with this, since we are on the edge, uh, let's thank Tom again. And the Zoom uh, room will stay open for further discussions, but uh, this is the end of the official seminar. And again, thank you very much. For, for thank you, Tom. Yeah.